you're looking at some of the most expensive photographs in human history. Each image is a frozen moment in time, captured by technological marvels engineered nearly half a century ago. Viking 1 and 2's pioneering journey to the dusty Martian surface revolutionized our understanding of Mars science. Viking was one of the most impactful exploration programs of the late space race, and brought back a wealth of intelligence about Mars' nature, geology, and capability to host extremophile life. So how did this rocket, this probe, and this lander transfer into the scientific revolution it is praised for? Okay, so let's start with why NASA wanted to send such complex probes to Mars in the first place. Don't forget to subscribe to 26 Dimensions if you love space exploration videos. Mars has charmed people since ancient people first set eyes on its star-like appearance in the night sky. It was convincing in a unique manner, a ball of dirty red that raced it way across the sky as the seasons passed. In the late 19th century, telescopes revealed fascinating details about Mars' surface. Astronomers found it featured many fascinating highlights, landforms and canyons, dust storms, great plains, and river deltas. From the very start, these details seemed far too human and Earth-like to be real, and they bewildered the first modern astronomers. After the closure of the Apollo program and decreasing public interest in lunar science, NASA had to switch up its research. Science fiction novels and popular culture were fermenting a cult-like following of Mars and America, and millions of taxpayers were desperate to learn more about the strange red world. Meanwhile, the state's scientists, geologists, and astrobiologists were yearning to unlock the history of Mars' landscape to find out if it could ever have hosted extraterrestrial life. These two motivating factors went hand in hand and pushed NASA over the fence. The Viking program consisted of a couple American space probes shift off to the Red Planet. Both Viking 1 and Viking 2 function on the same overall assembly containing two parts. Firstly, the orbiter. This highly engineered contraption would free fall into orbit around Mars to photograph the planet's landscape at scale. Second, the lander. This vehicle, which was around the size of a car, would plummet down to Mars' surface and give NASA scientists a genuine view of the red planet from the ground. Images and data would be relayed back to the shuttle in orbit and beamed to mission control on Earth. NASA had a few goals for the mission. First, Viking 1 would become the first spacecraft to land on Mars' surface. Both the orbiter and lander would take high-quality pictures of the Martian surface and describe the structure of the atmosphere. Most notably, it would gather the first tangible sample of Martian soil. This would send home an enormous wealth of information about Mars' dust and geology. On a quest for finding life on Mars, the missions were equipped with a range of data-gathering equipment to search for biological signatures. The dust gathered from the collector would be analyzed on board the lander. Viking 1 was dispatched on the 20th of August, 1975, and reached Mars by June 19, 1976. It injected into Mars' orbit, where it circled the red planet for a month. Throughout this time, Viking 1's orbiter imaged the surface and searched for decent landing sites. 30 days later, the module managed to identify an ideal touchdown site at Chris Planitia and acquired approval from NASA for landing module descents. Landing a spacecraft the size of a car with such delicate equipment on a faraway planet was no easy task. In fact, touching any kind or probe down onto Mars successfully is an enormous achievement. On July 20th, 1976 Viking 1's lander isolated from the orbiter and ascended to Christ Planitia. Meanwhile, Viking 2 was dispatched on September 9th, 1975 and entered Mars orbit on August 7th, 1976. Its lander touched down at Utopia Planitia on the 3rd of September. While the landers took pictures and gathered samples on the surface, the orbiter circled the red planet night and day. Each orbiting module was equipped with telescopes and high-resolution cameras to scan Mars in higher detail than ever before. After 706 cycles, Viking 2 finished transmitting the data from the orbiter and lander to Earth and went dark. It stopped communicating with Mission Control on July 25, 1978. Viking 1 survived much longer, achieving more than 1,400 complete orbits before being shut down on August 17, 1980. NASA had only expected the vehicles to last 90 days. Both exceeded this by a wide margin, making the mission a huge success. Photographs were continually returned to Earth by the landers until 1982. The Viking missions were intended to lead natural examinations of Martian soil and reveal indications of life on the red planet. However, 
The outcomes of this data were uncertain, and researchers battled over how to decipher the information. Regardless of how the data was interpreted, there was heaps of it. The two landers had way more power than NASA had expected. Because of the varieties in accessible daylight, solar panels would have been unreliable as a consistent power source for the landers. Instead, they were powered by radioisotope thermoelectric generators, gadgets that made power from the heat released by decaying plutonium. This fuel source made lengthy space missions possible so that Viking 1 and 2 could transmit all their data and images back to planet Earth. NASA wanted to know if life could possibly survive on Mars. The data sought to provide an answer to this question. When Viking 1 and 2 touched down on Mars in 1976, each carried several instruments. They were used to study the planet and look for signs of light. The labeled release equipment mixed small samples of Martian soil with drops of a nutrient solution. The instruments then sampled the atmosphere of its eternal chamber. If it detected traces of radioactive carbon-14, the thinking went, then the microorganisms in the soil must have metabolized the nutrients and emitted the carbon. Another chamber performed a controlled experiment, where temperatures were heated to deadly levels so any microbes would be killed. By comparing the result from the chambers, convincing evidence that there was microbes in the Martian soil could be acquired. The results were positive. Viking might have found life on Mars, but the scientists disputed the evidence, and it is still being discussed many decades later. NASA's Mars Pathfinder mission, dispatched in 1996, put a free-moving meander called Sojourner on the planet. It was one of the greatest achievements in space exploration during the 90s, and sent enormous amounts of data and photographs to Earth. It rapidly advanced our studies of Mars. It was later replaced by the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, which investigated the planet for far longer than anticipated. They returned more than 100,000 pictures before dust storms wrecked their sun panels in 2012. Presently, two NASA crafts are operational on the Martian surface. InSight is testing the planet's composition and has recently discovered that Mars quakes regularly disturb its surface. The Curiosity rover, launched in 2012, is still wheeling around in Gale Crater, taking selfies and analyzing the stones and residue left in the cavity's ancient lake bed. These rovers have taken massive engineering talents and effort and are huge achievements. But in my opinion, they do not come close to the accomplishments of the two Viking landers, the first human-made objects to touch down on Mars' dusty surface and set eyes upon a foreign, frightening world. What is also a frightening world is YouTube's recommendation system. I'm struggling to grow this channel and make more videos about space exploration, but growth is slow in the beginning, so I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to 26 Dimensions. I promise to only make consistent, high-quality content and interesting videos about space and engineering, and I hope you stick around. Thanks for watching.